The Goldfish by Arthur Train Part 2 out of 4 and Country. However, with a strange perversity due perhaps to our having the Declaration of Independence crammed down our throats as children, we in America seem obsessed with an ambition to create a social aristocracy. Loudly proclaimed as founded on achievement, which, in point of fact, is based on nothing but the possession of money. The achievement that most certainly lands one among the crowned heads of the American nobility is admittedly the achievement of having acquired in some way or other about five million dollars. And it is immaterial whether its possessor got it by hard work, inheritance, marriage, or the invention of a porous plaster. In the wider circle of New York society are to be found a considerable number of amiable persons who have bought their position by the lavish expenditure of money amassed through the clever advertising and sale of table relishes. Throat emollients, fireside novels, canned edibles, cigarettes, and chewing tobacco. The money was no doubt legitimately earned. The patent medicine man and the millionaire tailor have my entire respect. I do not sneer at honest wealth acquired by these humble means. The rise, if it be a rise of these and others like them, is superficial evidence, perhaps that ours is a democracy. Looking deeper, we see that it is, in fact, proof of our utter and shameless snobbery. Most of these people are in society not on account of their personal qualities, or even by virtue of the excellence of their cut plug or throat wash which, in truth, may be a real boon to mankind, but because they have that most imperative of all necessities money. The achievement by which they have become aristocrats is not the kind of achievement that should have entitled them to the distinction which is theirs. They are received and entertained for no other reason whatever save that they can receive and entertain in return. Their bank accounts are at the disposal of the other aristocrats, and so are their houses, automobiles, and yachts. The brevet of nobility by achievement is conferred on them, and the American people read of their comings and goings. Their balls, dinners, and other festivities with consuming and reverent interest. Most dangerously significant of all is the fact that, so long as the applicant for social honors has the money, the method by which he got it, however reprehensible, is usually overlooked. That a man is a thief, so long as he has stolen enough, does not impair his desirability. The achievement of wealth is sufficient in itself to entitle him to a seat in the American House of Lords. A substantial portion of the entertaining that takes place on Fifth Avenue is paid for out of pilfered money. Ten years ago this rhetorical remark would have been sneered at as demagogic. Today everybody knows that it is simply the fact. Yet we continue to eat with entire unconcern the dinners that have as it were, been abstracted from the dinner pails of the poor. I cannot conduct an investigation into the business history of every man who asks me to his house. And even if I know he has been a crook, I cannot afford to stir up an unpleasantness by attempting in my humble way to make him feel sorrow for his misdeeds. If I did, I might find myself alone deserted by the rest of the aristocracy who are concerned less with his morality than with the vintage of his wine and the dot he is going to give his daughter. The methods by which a newly rich American purchases a place among our nobility are simple and direct. He does not storm the inner citadel of society. 
He rents a house in a fashionable country suburb of New York and goes in and out of town on the dude train. He soon learns what professional people mingle in smart society and these he bribes to receive him and his family. He buys land and retains a smart lawyer to draw his deeds and attend to the transfer of title. He engages a fashionable architect to build his house, and a society young lady who has gone into landscape gardening to lay out his grounds. He cannot work the game through his dentist or plumber, but he establishes friendly relations with the swell local medical man and lets him treat an imaginary illness or two. He has his wife's portrait painted by an artist who makes a living off similar aspirants, and in exchange gets an invitation to drop into tea at the studio. He buys broken-winded hunters from the hunting set, decrepit ponies from the polo players and stone griffins for the garden from the social sculptress. A couple of hundred here, a couple of thousand there, and he and his wife are dining out among the people who run things. Once he gets a foothold, the rest is by comparison easy. The bribes merely become bigger and more direct. He gives a landing to the yacht club, a silver mug for the horse show, and an altar rail to the church. He entertains wisely gracefully discarding the doctor, lawyer, architect, and artist as soon as they are no longer necessary. He has, of course, already opened an account with the fashionable broker who lives near him, and insured his life with the well-known insurance man, his neighbor. He also plays poker daily with them on the train. This is the period during which he becomes a willing, almost eager, mark for the decayed sport, who purveys bad champagne and vends his own brand of noxious cigarettes. He achieves the stock exchange crowd without difficulty and moves on up into the banking set composed of trust company presidents, millionaires who have nothing but money, and the elite of the stockbrokers and bond men who handle their private business. The family are by this time going almost everywhere, and in a year or two, if the money holds out, they can buy themselves into the inner circles. It is only necessary to take a villa at Newport and spend about $100,000 in the course of the season. The walls of the city will fall down flat if the golden trumpet blows but mildly. And then, there they are right in the middle of the champagne, clam bakes and everything else, invited to sit with the choicest of America's nobility on golden chairs supplied from New York at one dollar per and to dance to the strains of the most expensive music amid the subdued popping of distant corks. In this social Arabian night's dream, however, you will find no sailors or soldiers, no great actors or writers. No real poets or artists, no genuine statesmen. The nearest you will get to any of these is the millionaire senator. Or the amateur decorators and portrait painters who, by making capital of their acquaintance, get a living out of society. You will find few real people among this crowd of intellectual children. The time has not yet come in America when a leader of smart society dares to invite to her table men and women whose only merit is that they have done something worthwhile. She is not sufficiently sure of her own place. She must continue all her social life to be seen only with the right people. In England her position would be secure and she could summon whom she would to dine with her. But in New York we have to be careful lest, 
by asking to our houses some distinguished actor or novelist. People might think we did not know we should select our friends not for what they are, but for what they have. In a word, the viciousness of our social hierarchy lies in the fact that it is based solely upon material success. We have no titles of nobility, but we have cold barons, merchant princes, and kings of finance. The very catchwords of our slang tell the story, the achievement of which we boast as the foundation of our aristocracy is indeed ignoble. But, since there is no other, we and our sons, and their sons after them, will doubtless continue to struggle and perhaps steal to prove. To the satisfaction of ourselves and the world at large, that we are entitled to be received into the nobility of America not by virtue of our good deeds, but of our so-called success. We would not have it otherwise. We should cry out against any serious attempt outside of the pulpit to alter or readjust an order that enables us to buy for money a position of which we would be otherwise undeserving. It would be most discouraging to us to have substituted for the present arrangement a society in which the only qualifications for admittance were those of charm, wit, culture, good breeding, and good sportsmanship. Chapter Roman 3 My children, I pride myself on being a man of the world in the better sense of the phrase, I feel no regret over the passing of those romantic days when maidens swooned at the sight of a drop of blood or took refuge in the vapors at the approach of a strange young man. In point of fact, I do not believe they ever did. I imagine that our popular idea of the fragility and sensitiveness of the weaker sex, based on the accounts of novelists of the 18th century, is largely a literary convention. Heroines were endowed, as a matter of course, with the possession of all the female virtues, intensified to such a degree that they were covered with burning blushes most of the time. Languor, hysteria, and general debility were regarded as the outward indications of a sweet and gentle character. Woman was a tendril clinging to the strong oak of masculinity. Modesty was her cardinal virtue. One is, of course, entitled to speculate on the probable contemporary causes for the seeming overemphases placed on this admirable characteristic. Perhaps feminine honesty was so rare as to be at a premium, and modesty was a sort of electric sign of virtue. I am not squeamish. I have always let my children read what they would. I have never made a mystery of the relations of the sexes, for I know the call of the unseen, the fascination lent by concealment. Of discovery, I believe frankness to be a good thing. A mind that is startled or shocked by the exposure of an ankle or the sight of a stocking must be essentially impure. Nor do I quarrel with woman's natural desire to adorn herself for the allurement of man. That is as inevitable as springtime, but unquestionably the general tone of social intercourse in America. At least in fashionable centers, has recently undergone a marked and striking change. The athletic girl of the last twenty years, the girl who invited tan and freckles, wielded the tennis bat in the morning and lay basking in a bathing suit on the sand at noon, is gradually giving way to an entirely different type, a type modeled, it would seem, at least so far as dress and outward characteristics are concerned. On the French demimondaine, 
There are plenty of athletic girls to be found on the golf links and tennis courts. But a growing and large minority of maidens at the present time are too cherry of their complexions to brave the sun. Big hats, cloud-like veils, high heels, paint and powder mark the passing of the vain hope that woman can attract the male sex by virtue of her eugenic possibilities alone. It is but another and unpleasantly suggestive indication that the simplicity of an older generation, the rugged virtue of a more frugal time has given place to the sophistication of the continent. When I was a lad, going abroad was a rare and costly privilege. A youth who had been to Rome, London and Paris, and had the unusual opportunity of studying the treasures of the Vatican, the Louvre and the National Gallery, was regarded with envy. Americans went abroad for culture, to study the glories of the past. Now the family that does not invade Europe at least every other summer is looked on as hopelessly old-fashioned. No clerk can find a job on the Rue de Rivoli or the Rue de la Paix unless he speaks fluently the dialect of the customers on whose trade his employer chiefly relies those from Pennsylvania. New York and Illinois. The American no longer goes abroad for improvement, but to amuse himself. A college freshman knows, at least by name, the latest beauty who haunts the Foley's Burgers, and his father probably has a refined and intimate familiarity with the special attractions of Cyros and the Trocadero. I do not deny that we have learned valuable lessons from the Parisians. At any rate, our cooking has vastly improved. Epicurus would have difficulty in choosing between the delights of New York and Paris for. After all, New York is Paris and Paris is New York. The chef of yesterday at Voisin's rules the kitchen of the Ritz-Carlton or the Plaza today. And he cannot have traveled much who does not find a dozen European acquaintances among the head waiters of Broadway. Not to know Paris nowadays is felt to be as great a humiliation as it was fifty years ago not to know one's Bible. Beyond the larger number of Americans who visit Paris for legitimate or semi-legitimate purposes, there is a substantial fraction who go to do things they either cannot or dare not do at home. And as those who have not the time or the money to cross the Atlantic and who still itch for the boulevards must be kept contented. Broadway is turned into Montmartre. The result is that we cannot take our daughters to the theater without risking familiarizing them with vice in one form or another. I do not think I am overstating the situation when I say that it would be reasonably inferred from most of our so-called musical shows and farces that the natural, Customary and excusable amusement of the modern man after working hours, whether the father of a family or a youth of twenty, is a promiscuous adventuring into sexual immorality. I do not regard as particularly dangerous the vulgar French farce where Papa is caught in some extraordinary and buffoon like situation with the washerwoman. Safety lies in exaggeration but it is a different matter with the ordinary Broadway show, where virtue is made at least inferentially the object of ridicule, and sexuality is the underlying purpose of the production. During the present New York theatrical season, several plays have been already censored by the authorities and either been taken off entirely or so altered as to be still within the bounds of legal pruriency. Whether I am right in attributing it to the influence of the French music halls or not, 
It is the fact that the tone of our theater-going public is essentially low. Boys and girls who are taken in their Christmas holidays to see plays at which their parents applaud questionable songs and suggestive dances cannot be blamed for assuming that there is not one set of morals for the stage and another for ordinary social intercourse. Hence the college boy who has kept straight for eight months in the year is apt to wonder, what is the use? And the debutante who is curious for all the experiences her new liberty makes possible takes it for granted that an amorous trifling is the ordinary incident to masculine attention. This is far from being mere theory. It is a matter of common knowledge that recently the most prominent restaurateur in New York found it necessary to lock up or place a couple of uniformed maids in every unoccupied room in his establishment whenever a private dance was given there for young people. Boys and girls of 18 would leave these dances by dozens and hiring taxicabs, go on slumming expeditions and excursions to the remoter corners of Central Park. In several instances parties of two or four went to the Tenderloin and had supper served in private rooms. This is the childish expression of a demoralization that is not confined simply to smart society, but is gradually permeating the community in general. From the ordinary dinner table conversation one hears at many of the country houses on Long Island, it would be inferred that marriage was an institution of value only for legitimatizing concubinage that an old-fashioned love affair was something to be rather ashamed of, and that morality in the young was hardly to be expected. Of course, a great deal of this is mere talk and bombast, but the maid servants hear it. I believe, fortunately, and my belief is based on a fairly wide range of observation, that the continental influence I have described has produced its ultimate effect chiefly among the rich. Yet its operation is distinctly observable throughout American life. Nowhere is this more patent than in much of our current magazine literature and light fiction. These stories, under the guise of teaching some moral lesson, are frequently designed to stimulate all the emotions that could be excited by the most vicious French novel. Some of them, of course, throw off all pretense and openly ape the petit histoire d'un amour. But essentially all are alike. The heroine is a demimondaine in everything but her alleged virtue the hero, a young bounder whose better self restrains him just in time. A conventional marriage on the last page legalizes what would otherwise have been a liaison, or a degenerate flirtation. The astonishingly unsophisticated and impossibly innocent shopgirl, who in the story just escapes the loss of her honor. The noble young man who heroically marries the girl, the adventures of the debonair actress who turns out most surprisingly to be an angel of sweetness and light. And the Johnny, whose heart is really pure gold, and who, to the reader's utter bewilderment, proves himself to be a St. George. These are the leading characters in a great deal of our periodical literature. A friend of mine who edits one of the more successful magazines tells me there are at least half a dozen writers, who are paid guaranteed salaries of from $12,000 to $18,000 a year for turning out each month from 5,000 to 10,000 words of what is euphemistically termed hot stuff. An erotic writer can earn yearly at the present time more than the salary of the President of the United States. What the physical result of all this is going to be does not seem to me to matter much. 
If the words of Jesus Christ have any significance, we are already debased by our imaginations. We are dangerously near an epoch of intellectual, if not carnal, debauchery. The prevailing tendency on the part of the young girls of today to imitate the dress and makeup of the Parisian cocotte is unconsciously due to this general lowering of the social moral tone. Young women in good society seem to feel that they must enter into open competition with their less fortunate sisters. And in this struggle for survival they are apparently determined to yield no advantage. Herein lies the popularity of the hobble skirt, the transparent fabric, that hides nothing and follows the move of every muscle, and the otherwise senseless peculiarities and indecencies of the more extreme of the present fashions. And here, too, is to be found the reason for the popularity of the current style of dancing, which offers no real attraction except the opportunity for a closeness of contact otherwise not permissible. It's all in the way it is done, says Mrs. Jones, making the customary defense. The tango and the turkey trot can be danced as unobjectionably as the waltz. Exactly, only the waltz is not danced that way, and if it were the offending couple, would probably be put off the floor. Moreover, their origin and history demonstrates their essentially vicious character. Is there any sensible reason why one's daughter should be encouraged to imitate the dances of the Apache and the Negro debauchee, perhaps? After all, the pendulum has merely swung just a little too far and is knocking against the case. The feet of modern progress cannot be hampered by too much of the dead underbrush of convention. The old-fashioned prudery that in former days practically prevented rational conversation between men and women is fortunately a thing of the past, and the fact that it is no longer regarded as unbecoming for women to take an interest in all the vital problems of the day municipal. Political and hygienic, provided they can assist in their solution, marks several milestones on the high road of advance. On the other hand, the widespread familiarity with these problems which has been engendered simply for pecuniary profit by magazine literature in the form of essays. Fiction, and even verse, is by no means an undiluted blessing, particularly if the accentuation of the author is on the roses lining the path of dalliance quite as much as on the destruction to which it leads. The very warning against evil may turn out to be in effect only a hint, that it is readily accessible. One does not leave the candy box open beside the baby even if the infant has received the most explicit instructions as to the probable effect of too much sugar upon its tiny kidneys. Moreover, the knowledge of the prevalence of certain vices suggests to the youthful mind that what is so universal must also be rather excusable or at least natural, it seems to me that while there is at present a greater popular knowledge of the high cost of sinning, there is at the same time a greater tolerance for sin itself. Certainly, this is true among the people who make up the circle of my friends. Wild oats are regarded as entirely a matter of course. No anecdote is too broad to be told openly at the dinner table. In point of fact, the stories that used to be whispered only very discreetly in the smoking room are now told freely as the natural relishes to polite conversation. In that respect, things are pretty bad. 
One cannot help wondering what goes on inside the villa on Rhode Island Avenue when the 18-year-old daughter of the house remarks to the circle of young men and women about her at a dance. Well, I am going to bed, Sewell. The listener furtively speculates about Mama. He feels quite sure about Papa. Anyhow, this particular mod attracted no comment. Doubtless the young lady was as far above suspicion as the wife of Caesar, but she and her companions in this particular set have an appalling frankness of speech and a callousness in regard to discussing the more personal facts of human existence that is startling to a middle-aged man like myself. I happened recently to overhear a bit of casual dinner-table conversation between two of the gilded ornaments of the junior set. He was a boy of twenty-five, well known for his dissipations, but nevertheless regarded by most mothers as a highly desirable party. Oh, yes, he remarked easily. They asked me if I wanted to go into a bug house, and I said I hadn't any particular objection. I was there a month, rum place, I should worry. What ward? she inquired with polite interest. Inebriates, of course, said he. I am inclined to attribute much of the questionable taste and conduct of the younger members of the fast set to neglect on the part of their mothers. Women who are busy all day and every evening with social engagements have little time to cultivate the friendship of their daughters. Hence the girl just coming out is left to shift for herself, and she soon discovers that a certain risque freedom in manner and conversation and a disregard of convention will win her a superficial popularity which she is apt to mistake for success. Totally ignorant of what she is doing or the essential character of the means she is employing, she runs wild and soon earns an unenviable reputation, which she either cannot live down or which she feels obliged to live up to in order to satisfy her craving for attention. Many a girl has gone wrong simply because she felt that it was up to her to make good her reputation for caring nothing for the proprieties. As against an increasing looseness in talk and conduct, it is interesting to note that heavy drinking is clearly going out of fashion in smart society. There can be no question as to that. My champagne bills are not more than a third of what they were ten years ago. I do not attribute this particularly to the temperance movement. But... As against eight quarts of champagne for a dinner of twenty which used to be about my average when we first began entertaining in New York three, are now frequently enough. I have watched the butler repeatedly at large dinner parties as he passed the wine and seen him fill only four or five glasses. Women rarely drink at all. About one man in three takes champagne. Of course, he is apt to drink whiskey instead, but by no means the same amount as formerly. If it were not for the convention requiring sherry, hock, champagne and liquors to be served, the modern host could satisfy practically all the serious liquid requirements of his guests with a quart bottle of scotch and a siphon of soda. Claret, Madeira, sparkling mosels and burgundies went out long ago. The fashion that has taught women self-control in eating has shown their husbands the value of abstinence. Unfortunately, I do not see in this a betterment in morals, but mere self-interest which may or may not be the same thing. According to one's philosophy, if a man drinks nowadays, he drinks because he wants to and not to be a good fellow. 
a total abstainer finds himself perfectly at home anywhere. Of course, the fashionables, if they are going to set the pace, have to hit it up in order to head the procession. The fastness of the smart set in England is notorious, and it is the same way in France, Russia, Italy, Germany, Scandinavia the world over, and as society tends to become unified mere national boundaries have less significance. The number of Americans who rent houses in London and Paris and shooting boxes in Scotland is large. Hence the moral tone of continental society and of the English aristocracy is gradually becoming more and more our own. But with this difference that, as the aristocracy in England and continental Europe is a separate caste, a well-defined order, having set meets and bounds, which considers itself superior to the rest of the population and views it with indifference. So its morals are regarded as more or less its own affair, and they do not have a wide influence on the community at large. Even if he drinks champagne every night at dinner, the Liverpool pickle merchant knows he cannot get into the king's set. But here the pickle man can not only break into the sacred circle, but he and his fat wife may themselves become the king and queen. So that a knowledge of how smart society conducts itself is an important matter to every man and woman living in the United States since each hopes eventually to make a million dollars and move to New York. With us the fast crowd sets the example for society at large, whereas in England looseness in morals is a recognized privilege of the aristocracy to which the commoner may not aspire. The worst feature of our situation is that the quasi-genteel working class of whom our modern complex life supports hundreds of thousands telephone operators, stenographers, and the like greedily devour the newspaper accounts of the American aristocracy and model themselves, so far as possible after it. It is almost unbelievable how intimate a knowledge these young women possess of the domestic life manner of speech and dress of the conspicuous people in New York society. I once stepped into the Waldorf with a friend of mine who wished to send a telephone message. He is a quiet, unassuming man of fifty, who inherited a large fortune, and who is compelled, rather against his will, to do a large amount of entertaining by virtue of the position in society which fate has thrust on him. It was a long-distance call, who shall I say wants to talk, asked the goddess with fillet-bound yellow hair in a patronizingly indifferent tone. Mr., answered my companion. Instantly the girl's face was suffused with a smile of excited wonder. Are you Mr.? the big swell who gives all the dinners and dances, she inquired. I suppose I am the man, he answered, rather amused than otherwise. Gee, she cried, ain't this luck? Look here, ma'am, she whispered hoarsely. I've got Mr. Here on a long distance. What do you think of that? One cannot doubt that this telephone girl would unhesitatingly regard as above criticism anything said or done by a woman who moved in Mr. S. circle. Unfortunately, what this circle does is heralded in exaggerated terms. The influence of these partially true and often totally false reports is far-reaching and demoralizing. The other day, the young governess of a friend of my wife gave up her position, saying she was to be married. 
Her employer expressed an interest in the matter and asked who was going to perform the ceremony. She was surprised to learn that the functionary was to be the local country justice of the peace. But why aren't you going to have a clergyman marry you? asked our friend. Because I don't want it to binding, answered the girl calmly. So far has the prevalence of divorce cast its enlightening beams. I have had a shooting box in Scotland on several different occasions, and my wife has conducted successful social campaigns. As I have said before, in London, Paris, Rome, and Berlin, I did not go along, but I read about it all in the papers and received weekly from the scene of conflict a pound or so of male matter, consisting of hundreds of diaphanous sheets of paper, each covered with my daughter's fashionable humpbacked handwriting. Hastings, my stenographer, became very expert at deciphering and transcribing it on the machine for my delectation. I was quite confused at the number and variety of the titles of nobility with which my family seemed constantly to be surrounded. They had a wonderful time, met everybody, and returned home perfected cosmopolitans. What their ethical standards are I confess I do not know exactly, for the reason that I see so little of them. They lead totally independent lives. On rare occasions we are invited to the same houses at the same time. And on Christmas Eve we still make it a point always to stay at home together. Really, I have no idea how they dispose of their time. They are always away, making visits in other cities or taking trips. They chatter fluently about literature, the theater, music, art, and know a surprising number of celebrities in this and other countries, particularly in London. They are good linguists and marvelous dancers. They are respectful, well-mannered, modest, and mildly affectionate. But, somehow they do not seem to belong to me. They have no troubles of which I am the confidant. If they have any definite opinions or principles, I am unaware of them, but they have the most exquisite taste. Perhaps with them this takes the place of morals. I cannot imagine my girls doing or saying anything vulgar. Yet what they are like when away from home I have no means of finding out. I am quite sure that when they eventually select their husbands I shall not be consulted in the matter. My formal blessing will be all that is asked, and if that blessing is not forthcoming no doubt, they will get along well enough without it. However, I am the constant recipient of congratulations on being the parent of such charming creatures. I have succeeded apparently in this direction as in others. Succeeded in what? I cannot imagine these girls of mine being any particular solace to my old age. Recently, since writing these confessions of mine, I have often wondered why my children were not more to me. I do not think they are much more to my wife. I suppose it could just as well be put the other way. Why are we not more to them? It is because, I fancy, this modern existence of ours, where every function and duty of maternity except the actual giving of birth is performed vicariously for us, destroys any interdependence between parents and their offspring. Smart American mothers no longer, I am informed, nurse their babies. I know that my wife did not nurse hers, 
and thereafter each child had its own particular French bond and governess besides. Our nursery was a model of dainty comfort. All the superficial elegancies were provided for. It was a sunny, dustless apartment, with snow-white muslins, white enamel, and a frieze of grotesque Noah's Ark animals perambulating round the wall. There were huge dolls' houses with electric lights, big closets of toys. From the earliest moment possible, these three infants began to have private lessons in everything, including drawing, music, and German. Their little days were as crowded with engagements then as now. Every hour was provided for. But among these multifarious occupations, there was no engagement with their parents. Even if their mother had not been overwhelmed with social duties herself, my babies would, I am confident, have had no time for their parent except at serious inconvenience and a tremendous sacrifice of time. To be sure, I used occasionally to watch them decorously eating their strictly supervised suppers in the presence of the governess. But the perfect arrangements made possible by my financial success rendered parents a superfluity. They never bumped their heads or soiled their clothes or dirted their little faces, so far as I knew. They never cried, at least I was never permitted to hear them. When the time came for them to go to bed, each raised a rosy little cheek and said sweetly, Good night. Papa, they had, I think, the usual children's diseases exactly which ones I am not sure of. But they had them in the hospital room at the top of the house, from which I was excluded and the diseases progressed with medical propriety in due course, and under the efficient management of starchy trained nurses. Their outdoor life consisted in walking the asphalt pavements of Central Park, varied with occasional visits to the roller skating rink. But their social life began at the age of four or five. I remember these functions vividly because they were so different from those of my own childhood. The first of these was when my eldest daughter attained the age of six years. Similar events in my private history had been characterized by violent games of blind man's buff, hide and seek. Hunt the slipper going to Jerusalem, ring round a rosy, and so on followed by a dish of ice cream and hair pulling. Not so with my offspring. Ten little ladies and gentlemen, accompanied by their maids, having been rearranged in the dressing room downstairs, were received by my daughter with due form in the drawing room. They were all flounced, ruffled, and beribboned. Two little boys of seven had on Eaton suits. Their behavior was impeccable. Almost immediately a professor of ledger domain made his appearance and, with the customary facility of his brotherhood, proceeded to remove tons of debris from presumably empty hats, rabbits from handkerchiefs, and hard-boiled eggs from childish noses and ears. The assembled group watched him with polite tolerance. At intervals there was a squeal of surprise, but it soon developed that most of them had already seen the same trickman half a dozen times. However, they kindly consented to be amused, and the professor gave way to a punch and judy show of a sublimated variety which the youthful audience viewed with mild approval. The entertainment concluded with a stereoptican exhibition of supposedly humorous events, which obviously did not strike the children as funny at all. 
Supper was laid in the dining room, where the table had been arranged as if for a banquet of diplomats. There were flowers in abundance and a life-sized swan of icing at each end. Each child was assisted by its own nurse, and our butler, and a footman served, in stolid dignity, a meal consisting of rice pudding, cereals, cocoa, bread and butter, and ice cream. It was by all odds the most decorous affair ever held in our house. At the end the gifts were distributed Parisian dolls, toy baby carriages and paint boxes for the girls. Steam engines, magic lanterns and miniature circuses for the boys. My bill for these trifles came to one hundred and twelve dollars. At half past six the carriages arrived and our guests were hurried away. I instance this affair because it struck the note of elegant propriety that has always been the tone of our family and social life. The children invited to the party were the little boys and girls whose fathers and mothers we thought most likely to advance their social interests later on. Of these children, two of the girls have married members of the foreign nobility, one a jaded English lord the other a worthless and dissipated French count, another married fifteen years later one of these same little boys and divorced him within eighteen months. While two of the girls our own have not married, of the boys one wedded an actress, another lives in Paris and studies art, one has been already accounted for, and two have given their lives to playing polo. The stock market and elevating the chorus. Beginning at this early period, my two daughters and later on my son met only the most select young people of their own age in New York and on Long Island. I remember being surprised at the amount of theater going they did by the time the eldest was nine years old. My wife made a practice of giving a children's theater party every Saturday and taking her small guests to the matinee. As the theaters were more limited in number then than now, these comparative infants sooner or later saw practically everything that was on the board's good, bad, and indifferent, and they displayed a precocity of criticism that quite astounded me. Their real social career began with children's dinners and dancing parties by the time they were twelve. And their later coming out changed little the mode of life to which they had been accustomed for several years before it. The result of their mother's watchful care and self-sacrifice is that these two young ladies could not possibly be happy or even comfortable if they married men unable to furnish them with French maids, motors, constant amusement, gay society, travel, and Paris clothes. Without these things they would wither away and die like flowers deprived of the sun. They are physically unfit to be anything but the wives of millionaires, and they will be the wives of millionaires or assuredly die unmarried. But, as the circle of rich young men of their acquaintance is more or less limited, their chances of matrimony are by no means bright. Albeit that they are the pivots of a furious whirl of gaiety which never stops. No young man with an income of less than twenty thousand a year would have the temerity to propose to either of them. Even on twenty thousand they would have a hard struggle to get along. It would mean the most rigid economy and, if there were babies, almost poverty. Besides, when girls are living in the luxury to which mine are accustomed, they think twice before essaying matrimony at all. 
the prospects of changing Newport, Palm Beach, Paris, Rome, Nice and Byrates for the privilege of bearing children in a New York apartment house does not allure. As in the case of less cosmopolitan young ladies, there must be love plus all present advantages, present advantages withdrawn. Love becomes cautious, even though the rich girl herself is of finer clay than her parents and, in spite of her artificial environment, and the false standards by which she is surrounded. Would like to meet, and perhaps eventually marry some young man who is more worth while than the pet cats of her acquaintance. She is practically powerless to do so. She is cut off by the impenetrable artificial barrier of her own exclusiveness. She may hear of such young men, young fellows of ambition, of adventurous spirit of genius, who have already achieved something in the world. But they are outside the wall of money and she is inside it, and there is no way for them to get in or for her to get out. She is permitted to know only the Junes Dory, the fops, the sports, the club window men, whose antecedents are vouched for by the social register. She has no way of meeting others. She does not know what the others are like. She is only aware of an instinctive distaste for most of the young fellows among whom she is thrown. At best they are merely innocuous when they are not offensive. They do nothing. They intend never to do anything. If she is the American girl of our plays and novels, she wants something better. And in the plays and novels, she always gets him the dashing young ranchman, the heroic naval lieutenant, the fearless Alaskan explorer, the tireless prospector or daring civil engineer. But in real life, she does not get him except by the merest fluke of fortune. She does not know the real thing when she meets it, and she is just as likely to marry a dissipated groom or chauffeur as the young Stanley of her dreams. The saddest class in our social life is that of the thoroughbred American girl, who is a thousand times too good for her deluxe surroundings and the crew of vacuous lad doll willies hanging about her. Yet, who, absolutely cut off from contact with any others, either gradually fades into a peripatetic old maid, wandering over Europe, or marries an eligible, turkey-trotting nondescript a Mimini Pimini, Francesca da Rimini. Je ne sais quoi, young man. The Atlantic seaboard swarms in summertime with broad-shouldered, well-bred, highly educated and charming boys, who have had every advantage except that of being waited on by liveried footmen. They camp in the woods, tutor the feeble-minded sons of the rich, tramp and bicycle over Swiss mountain passes, sail their catboats through the island-studded reaches and thoroughfares of the main coast, and grow brown and hard under the burning sun. They are the hope of America. They can carry a canoe or a hundred-pound pack over a forest trail. And in the winter they set the pace in the scientific, law and medical schools. Their heads are clear, their eyes are bright, and there is a hollow instead of a bow window beneath the buttons of their waistcoats. The feet of these young men carry them to strange places. They cope with many and strange monsters. They are our knights of the round table. They find the grail of achievement in lives of hard work, simple pleasures, and high ideals in college and factory towns. In law courts and hospitals, in the mountains of Colorado and the plains of the Dakotas, 
They are the best we have, but the poor rich girl rarely, if ever, meets them. The barrier of wealth completely hems her in. She must take one of those inside or nothing. When, in a desperate revolt against the artificiality of her existence, she breaks through the wall, she is easy game for anybody as likely to marry a jockey or a professional forger as one of the young men of her desire. One should not blame a rich girl too much for marrying a titled and perhaps attractive foreigner. The would-be critic has only to step into a Fifth Avenue ballroom and see what she is offered in his place to sympathize with and perhaps applaud her selection. Better a year of Europe than a cycle of, shall we say, Narragansett. After all, why not take the real thing? such as it is, instead of an imitation. I believe that one of the most cruel results of modern social life is the cutting off of young girls from acquaintanceship with youths of the sturdy, intelligent and hard-working type, and the unfitting of such girls for anything except the marriage mart of the millionaire. I would give half of all I possess to see my daughters happily married, but I now realize that their education renders such a marriage highly difficult of satisfactory achievement. Their mother and I have honestly tried to bring them up in such a way that they can do their duty in that state of life to which it hath pleased God to call them. But unfortunately, unless some man happens to call them also, they will have to keep on going round and round as they are going now. We did not anticipate the possibility of their becoming old maids, and they cannot become brides of the church. I should honestly be glad to have either of them marry almost anybody, provided he is a decent fellow. I should not even object to their marrying foreigners. But the difficulty is that it is almost impossible to find out whether a foreigner is really decent or not. It is true that the number of foreign noblemen who marry American girls for love is negligible. There is undoubtedly a small and distinguished minority who do so, but the transaction is usually a matter of bargain and sale and the man regards himself as having lived up to his contract by merely conferring his title on the woman he thus deigns to honor. I should prefer to have them marry Americans, of course, but I no longer wish them to marry Americans of their own class. Yet, unfortunately, they would be unwilling to marry out of it, a curious situation, I have given up my life to buying a place for my children that is supposed to give them certain privileges. And I now am loath to have them take advantage of those privileges. The situation has its amusing, as well as its pathetic side for my son, now that I come to think of it. Is one of the eligibles. He knows everybody, and is on the road to money. He is one of the opportunities that society is offering to the daughters of other successful men. Should I wish my own girls to marry a youth like him? Far from it. Yet he is exactly the kind of fellow that my success has enabled them to meet and know and whom fate decrees that they shall eventually marry if they marry at all. When I frankly face the question of how much happiness I get out of my children, I am constrained to admit that it is very little. The sense of proprietorship in three such finished products is something to be sure. And, after all, I suppose they have concealed somewhere a real affection for their old dad. At times they are facetious, almost playful, as on my birthday, 
but I fancy that arises from a feeling of embarrassment at not knowing how to be intimate with a parent who crosses their path only twice a week. And then on the stairs. My son has attended to his own career now for some fourteen years. In fact, I lost him completely before he was out of Knickerbockers. Up to the time when he was sent away to boarding school, he spent a rather disconsolate childhood playing with mechanical toys, roller skating in the mall, going occasionally to the theater, and taking music lessons. But he showed so plainly the debilitating effect of life in the city for eight months in the year that at twelve he was bundled off to a country school. Since then he has grown to manhood without our assistance. He went away undersized, pale, with a meager little neck and a sort of wistful Nicholas Nickelby expression. When he returned at the Christmas vacation he had gained ten pounds, was brown and freckled, and looked like a small giraffe in pantalets. Moreover, he had entirely lost the power of speech, owing to a fear of making a fool of himself. During the vacation in question, he was reoutfitted and sent three times a week to the theater. On one or two occasions, I endeavored to ascertain how he liked school, but all I could get out of him was the vague admission that it was all right and that he liked it well enough. This process of outgrowing his clothes and being put through a course of theaters at each vacation, there was nothing else to do with him continued for seven years, during which time he grew to be six feet two inches in height and gradually filled out to man's size. He managed to hold a place in the lower third of his class, with the aid of constant and expensive tutoring in the summer vacations. And he finally was graduated with the rest and went to Harvard. By this time, he preferred to enjoy himself in his own way during his leisure, and we saw less of him than ever. But, whatever his intellectual achievements may be, there is no doubt as to his being a man of the world. Entirely at ease anywhere, with perfect manners and all the social graces. I do not think he was particularly dissipated at Harvard. On the other hand, I am assured by the dean that he was no student. He made a select club early in his course, and from that time was occupied, I suspect, in playing poker and bridge, discussing deep philosophical questions, and acquiring the art of living. He never went in for athletics, but by doing nothing in a highly artistic manner, and by dancing with the most startling agility, he became a prominent social figure and a headliner in college theatricals. From his sophomore year he has been in constant demand for cotillions, house parties and yachting trips. His intimate pals seem to be middle-aged millionaires who are known to me in only the most casual way. And he is a sort of gentleman in waiting I believe the accepted term is pet cat to several society women for whom he devises new cotillion figures, arranges original after-dinner entertainments, and makes himself generally useful. Like my two daughters, he has arrived absolutely, but, though we are members of the same learned profession, he is almost a stranger to me. I had no difficulty in getting him a clerkship in a gilt-edged law firm immediately after he was admitted to the bar, and he is apparently doing marvelously well. Though what he can possibly know of law will always remain a mystery to me. 
Yet he is already, at the age of 28, a director in three important concerns whose securities are listed on the stock exchange, and he spends a great deal of money, which he must gather somehow. I know that his allowance cannot do much more than meet his accounts at the smart clubs to which he belongs. He is a pleasant fellow, and I enjoy the rare occasions when I catch a glimpse of him. I do not think he has any conspicuous vices or virtues. He has simply had sense enough to take advantage of his social opportunities and bids fair to be equally successful with myself. He has really never done a stroke of work in his life, but has managed to make himself agreeable to those who could help him along. I have no doubt those rich friends of his throw enough business in his way to net him ten or fifteen thousand dollars a year. But I should hesitate to retain him to defend me if I were arrested for speeding. Nevertheless, at dinner I have seen him bully rack and browbeat a judge of our Supreme Court in a way that made me shudder. Though I admit that the judge in question owed his appointment entirely to the friend of my son who happened to be giving the dinner, and he will contradict in a loud tone men and women older than myself, no matter what happens to be the subject under discussion. They seem to like it why, I do not pretend to understand. They admire his assurance and good nature, and are rather afraid of him. I cannot imagine what he would find to do in my own law office. He would doubtless regard it as a dull place and too narrow a sphere for his splendid capabilities. He is a clever chap, this son of mine and though neither he nor his sisters seem to have any particular fondness for one another. He is astute at playing into their hands and they into his. He also keeps a watchful eye on our dinner invitations, so they will not fall below the properly exclusive standard. What are you asking old Washburn for, he will ask. He's been a dead one these five years, or I should cut out the Becketts at least if you are asking the Thompsons. They don't go with the same crowd, or why don't you ask the Peyton Smiths? They are nothing to be afraid of if they do cut a dash at Newport. The old girl is rather a pal of mine, so we drop old Washburn, cut out the Becketts, and take courage and invite the hyphenated Smiths. A hint from him pays handsome dividends, and he is distinctly proud of the family and anxious to push it along to still greater success. However, he has never asked my help or assistance except in a financial way. He has never come to me for advice, never confided any of his perplexities or troubles to me. Perhaps he has none. He seems quite sufficient unto himself. And he certainly is not my friend. It seems strange that these three children of mine, whose upbringing has been the source of so much thought and planning on the part of my wife and myself, and for whose ultimate benefit we have shaped our own lives, should be the merest, almost impersonal, acquaintances. The Italian fruit vendor on the corner, whose dirty offspring crawl among the empty barrels behind the stand, knows far more of his children than do we of ours, will have far more influence on the shaping of their future lives. They do not need us now, and they never have needed us. A trust company could have performed all the offices of parenthood with which we have been burdened. We have paid others to be father and mother in our stead, or rather, as I now see, 
have had hired servants to go through the motions for us, and they have done it well, so far as the mere physical side of the matter is concerned. We have been almost entirely relieved of care. We have never been annoyed by our children's presence at any time. We have never been bothered with them at meals. We have never had to sit up with them when they could not go to sleep. Or watch at their bedsides during the night when they were sick. Competent nurses far more competent than we washed their little dirty hands, mended the torn dresses and kissed their wounds to make them well. And when five o'clock came, three dainty little Dresden figures in pink and blue ribbons were brought down to the drawing room to be admired by our guests. Then, after being paraded, they were carried back to the nursery to resume the even tenor of their independent existences. No one of us has ever needed the other members of the family. My wife has never called on either of our daughters to perform any of those trifling intimate services that bring a mother and her children together. There has always been a maid standing ready to hook up her dress, fetch her book or her hat, or a footman to spring upstairs after the forgotten gloves. And the girls have never needed their mother the governess could read aloud ever so much better and they always had their own maid to look after their clothes. When they needed new gowns, they simply went downtown and bought them, and the bill was sent to my office. Neither of them was ever forced to stay at home, that her sister might have some pleasure instead. No, our wealth has made it possible for each of my children to enjoy every luxury without any sacrifice on another's part. They owe nothing to each other, and they really owe nothing to their mother or myself except perhaps a monetary obligation. But there is one person, technically not one of our family, for whom my girls have the deepest and most sincere affection, that is old Jane. Their Irish nurse, who came to them just after they were weaned, and stayed with us until the period of maids and governesses arrived. I paid her twenty-five dollars a month, and for nearly ten years she never let them out of her sight crooning over them at night. Trudging after them during the daytime, mending their clothes, brushing their teeth, cutting their nails, and teaching them strange Irish legends of the Banshee. When I called her into the library and told her the children were now too old for her and that they must have a governess, the look that came into her face haunted me for days. Ye will be after taking my darlings away from me, she muttered in a dead tone. She will be hard for me. She stood as if the heart had died within her, and the hundred-dollar bill I shoved into her hand fell to the floor. Then she turned quickly and hurried out of the room without a sob. I heard afterward that she cried for a week. Now I always know when one of their birthdays has arrived by the queer package. Addressed in old Jane's quaint half-printed writing, that always comes. She has cared for many dozens of children since then, but loves none like my girls, for she came to them in her young womanhood, and they were her first charges. And they are just as fond of her. Indeed, it is their loyalty to this old Irish nurse that gives me faith that they are not the cold propositions they sometimes seem to be. For once when, after much careless delay, a fragmentary message came to us that she was ill, and in a hospital my two daughters, 
who were just starting for a ball, flew to her bedside, sat with her all through the night, and never left her until she was out of danger. They brought me back, my darlings, she whispered to us when later we called to see how she was getting on. And my wife looked at me across the rumpled cot and her lips trembled. I knew what was in her mind. Would her daughters have rushed to her with the same forgetfulness of self as to this prematurely gray and wrinkled woman, whose shrunken form lay between us? Poor old Jane, alone in an alien land, giving your life and your love to the children of others, only to have them torn from your arms just as the tiny fingers have entwined themselves like tendrils round your heart. We have tossed you the choicest blessings of our lives and shouldered you with the heavy responsibilities that should rightfully have been our load. Your cup has run over with both joy and sorrow, but you have drunk of the cup while we are still thirsty. Our hearts are dry. While yours is green nourished with the love that should belong to us, Poor old Jane, lucky old Jane, anyhow God bless you. Chapter Roman 4, My Mind I come of a family that prides itself on its culture and intellectuality. We have always been professional people, for my grandfather was, as I have said, a clergyman. And among my uncles are a lawyer, a physician, and a professor. My sisters, also, have intermarried with professional men. I received a fairly good primary and secondary education, and graduated from my university with honors whatever that may have meant. I was distinctly of a literary turn of mind, and during my four years of study, I imbibed some slight information concerning the English classics. Music, modern history, and metaphysics. I could talk quite wisely about Chaucer, Beaumont, and Fletcher. Thomas Love Peacock and Anne Radcliffe, or Kant, Fisht and Schopenhauer. I can see now that my smattering of culture was neither deep nor broad. I acquired no definite knowledge of underlying principles, of general history, of economics, of languages, of mathematics, of physics, or of chemistry. To biology and its allies, I paid scarcely any attention at all, except to take a few snap courses. I really secured only a surface acquaintance with polite English literature mostly very modern. The main part of my time I spent reading Stevenson and Kipling. I did well in English composition, and I pronounced my words neatly and in a refined manner. At the end of my course, when twenty-two years old, I was handed an imitation parchment degree and proclaimed by the president of the college as belonging to the Brotherhood of Educated Men, I did not. I was an imitation-educated man, but, though spurious, I was a sufficiently good counterfeit to pass current for what I had been declared to be. Apart from a little Latin, a considerable training in writing the English language, and a great deal of miscellaneous reading of an extremely light variety, I really had no culture at all. I could not speak an idiomatic sentence in French or German. I had the vaguest ideas about applied mechanics and science, and no thorough knowledge about anything. But I was supposed to be an educated man, and on this stock in trade I have done business ever since with. To be sure, the added capital of a degree of Bachelor of Laws now, since my graduation, twenty-eight years ago, 
I have given no time to the systematic study of any subject except law. I have read no serious works dealing with either history, sociology, economics, art, or philosophy. I am supposed to know enough about these subjects already. I have rarely read over again any of the masterpieces of English literature with which I had at least a bowing acquaintance when at college. Even this last sentence I must qualify to the extent of admitting that I now see that this acquaintance was largely vicarious, and that I frequently read more criticism than literature. It is characteristic of modern education that it is satisfied with the semblance and not the substance of learning. I was taught about Shakespeare, but not Shakespeare. I was instructed in the history of literature, but not in literature itself. I knew the names of the works of numerous English authors, and I knew what Taine and others thought about them. But I knew comparatively little of what was between the covers of the books themselves. I was, I find, a student of letters by proxy. As time went on, I gradually forgot that I had not, in fact, actually perused these volumes, and today I am accustomed to refer familiarly to works I never have read at all not a difficult task in these days of handbook knowledge and literary varnish. It is this patent superficiality that so bores me with the affected culture of modern social intercourse. We all constantly attempt to discuss abstruse subjects in philosophy and art, and pretend to a familiarity with minor historical characters and events. Now why try to talk about Bergson's theories if you have not the most elementary knowledge of philosophy or metaphysics? Or why attempt to analyze the success or failure of a modern post-impressionist painter when you are totally ignorant of the principles of perspective or of the complex problems of light and shade? You are equally qualified. I frankly confess that my own ignorance is abysmal. In the last 28 years, what information I have acquired has been picked up principally from newspapers and magazines. Yet my library table is littered with books on modern art and philosophy, and with essays on literary and historical subjects. I do not read them. They are my intellectual window dressings. I talk about them with others who, I suspect, have not read them either, and we confine ourselves to generalities. With a careful qualification of all expressed opinions, no matter how vague and elusive. For example, a safe conversational opening. Of course, there is a great deal to be said in favor of Bergson's general point of view. But, to me, his reasoning is inconclusive. Don't you feel the same way somehow? You can try this on almost anybody. It will work in 99 cases out of a 100. For, of course, there is a great deal to be said in favor of the views of anybody who is not an absolute fool. And most reasoning is open to attack at least for being inconclusive. It is also inevitable that your cultured friend or acquaintance should feel the same way somehow. Most people do in a way. The real truth of the matter is, all I know about Bergson is that he is a Frenchman. Is he actually by birth a Frenchman or a Belgian? who as a philosopher has a great reputation on the continent and who recently visited America to deliver some lectures. I have not the faintest idea what his theories are, and I should not if I heard him explain them. Moreover, 
I cannot discuss philosophy or metaphysics intelligently, because I have not today the rudimentary knowledge necessary to understand what it is all about. It is the same with art. On the one or two isolated varnishing days when we go to a gallery, we criticize the pictures quite fiercely. We know what we like, yes, perhaps we do. I am not sure even of that. But in 85 cases out of a hundred none of us have any knowledge of the history of painting or any intelligent idea of why Velasquez is regarded as a master. Yet we acquire a glib familiarity with the names of half a dozen cubists or futurists, and bandy them about much as my office boy does the names of his favorite pugilists or baseball players. It is even worse with history and biography. We cannot afford or have not the decency to admit that we are uninformed. We speak casually of, say, Henry of Navarre or Beatrice de Est or Charles V. I select my names intentionally from among the most celebrated in history, yet how many of us know within two hundred years of when any one of them lived or much about them? How much definite historical information have we, even about matters of genuine importance? Let us take a shot at a few dates. I will make it childishly easy. Give me, if you can, even approximately, the year of Caesar's conquest of Gaul, the invasion of Europe by the Huns, the sack of Rome, the Battle of Chalons sur Marne, the Battle of Tours, the crowning of Charlemagne, the Great Crusade, the fall of Constantinople, Magna Charta, the Battle of Cressy, the Field of the Cloth of Gold, the Massacre of St. Bartholomew, the Spanish Armada, the Execution of King Charles I, the Fall of the Bastille, the Inauguration of George Washington, the Battle of Waterloo, the Louisiana Purchase, the Indian Mutiny, the Siege of Paris. I will look out of the window while you go through the mental agony of trying to remember it looks easy, does it not? Almost an affront to ask the date of Waterloo. Well, I want it to be fair and even things up. But, honestly, can you answer correctly five out of these twenty elementary questions? I doubt it. Yet you have, no doubt, lying on your table at the present time, intimate studies of past happenings and persons that presuppose and demand a rough general knowledge of American, French or English history. The dean of Radcliffe College, who happened to be sitting behind two of her recent graduates while attending a performance of Parker's deservedly popular play Disraeli last winter, Overheard one of them say to the other, You know, I couldn't remember whether Disraeli was in the Old or the New Testament. And I looked in both and couldn't find him in either. I still pass socially as an exceptionally cultured man, one who is well up on these things. Yet I confess to knowing today absolutely nothing of history either ancient, medieval, or modern. It is not a matter of mere dates, by any means, though I believe dates to be of some general importance. My ignorance is deeper than that. I do not remember the events themselves or their significance. I do not now recall any of the facts connected with the great epoch-making events of classic times. I cannot tell as I write, for example, who fought in the Battle of the Alia, why Caesar crossed the Rubicon, or why Cicero delivered an oration against Catiline, 
As to what subsequently happened on the Italian peninsula, my mind is a blank until the appearance of Garibaldi during the last century. I really never knew just who Garibaldi was until I read Trevelyan's three books on the Risorgimento last winter. And those I perused because I had taken a motor trip through Italy the summer before. I know practically nothing of Spanish history, and my mind is a blank as to Russia, Poland, Turkey, Sweden, Germany, Austria, and Holland. Of course, I know that the Dutch Republic rose assisted by one Motley of Boston, and that William of Orange was a Hollander, or at least I suppose he was born there. But how Holland came to rise I know not, or whether William was named after an orange or oranges were named after him. As for Central Europe, it is a shocking fact that I never knew there was not some interdependency between Austria and Germany until last summer. I only found out the contrary when I started to motor through the Austrian Tyrol and was held up by the custom officers on the frontier. I knew that an old emperor named William somehow founded the German Empire out of little states with the aid of Bismarck and von Moltke. But that is all I know about it. I do not know when the war between Prussia and Austria took place or what battles were fought in it. The only battle in the Franco-Prussian War I am sure of is Sedan, which I remember because I was once told that Phil Sheridan was present as a spectator. I know Gustavus Adolphus was a king of Sweden, but I do not know when, and apart from their names, I know nothing of Theodoric. Charles Martel, Peter the Hermit, Lodovico Moro, the Emperor Maximilian, Catherine of Aragon, Catherine de Medici, Richelieu, Frederick Barbarossa, Cardinal Wolsey, Prince Rupert, I do not refer to Anthony Hope's hero, Rupert of Hensau St. Louis, Admiral Coligny, or the thousands of other illustrious personages that crowd the pages of history. I do not know when or why the Seven Years' War, the Thirty Years' War, the Hundred Years' War, or the Massacre of St. Bartholomew took place, why the Edict of Nantes was revoked, or what it was, or who fought at Malplaquet, Tours, Soissons, Marengo, Plassey, Audenard, Fontenoy, or Borodino, or when they occurred, I probably did know most if not all of these things, but I have entirely forgotten them. Unfortunately, I managed to act as if I had not. The result is that, having no foundation to build on, any information I do acquire is immediately swept away. People are constantly giving me books on special topics, such as Horace Walpole and his friends, France in the 13th century. The Holland House Circle, or Memoirs of Madame du Barry, but of what use can they be to me when I do not know? or at least have forgotten, even the salient facts of French and English history. We are undoubtedly the most superficial people in the world about matters of this sort. Any bluff goes. I recall being at a dinner not long ago when somebody mentioned Conrad Roman too. One of the guests hazarded the opinion that he had died in the year 1330. This would undoubtedly have passed muster, but for a learned-looking person farther down the table who deprecatingly remarked, I do not like to correct you. But I think Conrad II died in 1337. The impression created on the assembled company cannot be overstated. Later on in the smoking room, 
I ventured to compliment the gentleman on his fund of information, saying, Why, I never even heard of Conrad the Second, nor I either, he answered shamelessly. It is the same with everything music, poetry, politics. I go night after night to hear the best music in the world given at fabulous cost in the Metropolitan Opera House, and am content to murmur vague ecstasies over Caruso. Without being aware of who wrote the opera, or what it is all about. Most of us know nothing of orchestration or even the names of the different instruments. We may not even be sure of what is meant by counterpoint, or the difference between a fugue and an arpeggio. A handbook would give us these minor details in an hour's reading, but we prefer to sit vacuously making feeble jokes about the singers or the occupants of the neighboring boxes. Without a single intelligent thought as to why the composer attempted to write precisely this sort of an opera. When he did it, or how far he succeeded, we are content to take our opinions and criticisms ready made, no matter from whose mouth they fall, and one hears everywhere phrases that, once let loose from the Pandora's box of some foolish brain, never cease from troubling. In science I am in even a more parlous state. I know nothing of applied electricity in its simplest forms. I could not explain the theory of the gas engine, and plumbing is to me one of the great mysteries. Last, but even more lamentable, I really know nothing about politics though I am rather a strong party man, and my name always appears on important citizens' committees about election time. I do not know anything about the city departments or its fiscal administration. I should not have the remotest idea where to direct a poor person who applied to me for relief. Neither have I ever taken the trouble to familiarize myself with even the more important city buildings. Of course, I know the city hall by sight, but I have never been inside it. I have never visited the tombs or any one of our criminal courts. I have never been in a police station, a firehouse, or inspected a single one of our prisons or reformatory institutions. I do not know whether police magistrates are elected or appointed, and I could not tell you in what congressional district I reside. I do not know the name of my alderman, assemblyman, state senator or representative in Congress. I do not know who is at the head of the fire department, the street cleaning department, the health department, park department or the water department, and I could not tell, except for the police department, what other departments there are. Even so, I do not know what police precinct I am living in, the name of the captain in command, or where the nearest fixed post is at which an officer is supposed to be on duty. As I write, I can name only five members of the United States Supreme Court, three members of the cabinet, and only one of the congressmen from the state of New York. This in cold type seems almost preposterous, but it is, nevertheless, a fact, and I am an active practicing lawyer besides. I am shocked to realize these things. Yet I am supposed to be an exceptionally intelligent member of the community and my opinion is frequently sought on questions of municipal politics. Needless to say, the same indifference has prevented my studying except in the most superficial manner the single tax. Free trade and protection, 
the minimum wage, the recall referendum, or any other of the present much mooted questions. How is this possible? The only answer I can give is that I have confined my mental activities entirely to making my legal practice as lucrative as possible. I have taken things as I found them and put up with abuses rather than go to the trouble to do away with them. I have no leisure to try to reform the universe. I leave that task to others whose time is less valuable than mine and who have something to gain by getting into the public eye. The mere fact, however, that I am not interested in local politics would not ordinarily, in a normal state of civilization, explain my ignorance of these things. In most societies they would be the usual subjects of conversation. People naturally discuss what interests them most. Uneducated people talk about the weather, their work, their ailments, and their domestic affairs. With more enlightened folk, the conversation turns on broader topics, the state of the country, politics, trade, or art. It is only among the so-called society people that the subjects selected for discussion do not interest anybody. Usually the talk that goes on at dinners or other entertainments relates only to what plays the conversationalists in question have seen or which of the best sellers they have read. For the rest the conversation is dexterously devoted to the avoidance of the disclosure of ignorance. Even among those who would like to discuss the questions of the day intelligently and to ascertain other people's views pertaining to them, there is such a fundamental lack of elementary information that it is a hopeless undertaking. They are reduced to the commonplaces of vulgar and superficial comment. Tis plain, cry they, our mayors and naughty. And as for the corporation, shocking. The mayor may be and probably is a naughty, but his critics do not know why. The average woman who dines out hardly knows what she is saying or what is being said to her. She will usually agree with any proposition that is put to her if she has heard it. Generally, she does not listen. I know a minister's wife who never pays the slightest attention to anything that is being said to her. Being engrossed in a torrent of explanation regarding her children's education and minor diseases. Once a bored companion, in a momentary pause, fixed her sternly with his eye and said distinctly, But I don't give a about your children, at which the lady smiled brightly and replied, Yes. Quite so, exactly, as I was saying, Johnny got a, but, apart from such hectic people, who run quite amok whenever they open their mouths. There are large numbers of men and women of some intelligence who never make the effort to express conscientiously any ideas or opinions. They find it irksome to think. They are completely indifferent as to whether a play is really good or bad or who is elected mayor of the city. In any event, they will have their coffee, rolls and honey served in bed the next morning. And they know that, come what will flood, tempest, fire or famine, there will be 46 quarts of extra XXX milk left at their area door. They are secure. The stock market may rise and fall. Presidents come and go, but they will remain safe in the security of 50,000 a year. And, since they really do not care about anything, they are as likely to praise as to blame, and to agree with everybody about everything. Their world is all cakes and ale, why should they bother as to whether the pothouse beer is bad? 
I confess, with something of a shock, that essentially I am like the rest of these people. The reason I am not interested in my country and my city is because by reason of my financial and social independence. They have ceased to be my city and country. I should be just as comfortable if our government were a monarchy. It really is nothing to me whether my tax rate is six one hundredths of one percent higher or lower, or what mayor rules in City Hall. So long as Fifth Avenue is decently paved, Tammany or Republican administration in the city, so far as I am concerned, my valet will still come into my bedroom at exactly nine o'clock every morning. Turn on the heat and pull back the curtains. His low, modulated your bath is ready, sir, will steal through my dreams. And he will assist me to rise and put on my embroidered dressing gown of wadded silk in preparation for another day's hard labor in the service of my fellow men. Times have changed since my father's frugal college days. Have they changed for better or for worse? Of one thing I am certain my father was a better educated man than I am. I admit that, under the circumstances, this does not imply very much, but my parent had, at least, some solid ground beneath his intellectual feet on which he could stand. His mind was thoroughly disciplined by rigid application to certain serious studies that were not selected by himself. From the day he entered college he was in active competition with his classmates in all his studies, and if he had been a shirker, they would all have known it. In my own case, after I had once matriculated, the elective system left me free to choose my own subjects, and to pursue them faithfully or not. So long as I could manage to squeak through my examinations, my friends were not necessarily among those who elected the same courses, and whether I did well or ill was nobody's business, but my own and the dean's. It was all very pleasant, and exceedingly lackadaisical, and by the time I graduated I had lost whatever power of concentration I had acquired in my preparatory schooling. At the law school I was at an obvious disadvantage with the men from the smaller colleges, which still followed the old-fashioned curriculum and insisted on the mental discipline entailed by advanced Greek. Latin, the higher mathematics, science and biology. In point of fact I loafed delightfully for four years and let my mind run absolutely to seed. While I smoked pipe after pipe under the elms watching the squirrels and dreaming dreams, I selected elementary, almost childlike courses in a large variety of subjects, and as soon as I had progressed sufficiently to find them difficult I cast about for other snaps to take their places. My bookcase exhibited a collection of primers on botany, zoology and geology, the fine arts, music, elementary, French, and German. Philosophy, ethics, metaphysics, architecture, English composition, Shakespeare, the English poets and novelists. Oral debating and modern history. I took nothing that was not easy and about, which I did not already know a little something. I attended the minimum number of lectures required, did the smallest amount of reading possible, and by cramming vigorously for three weeks at the end of the year, managed to pass all examinations creditably. I averaged, I suppose, outside of the lecture room, about a single hour's desultory work a day. I really need not have done that. When, for example, 
It came time to take the examination in French composition. I discovered that I had read but two out of the fifteen plays and novels required. The plots of any one of which I might be asked to give on my paper. Rather than read these various volumes, I prepared a skeleton digest in French, sufficiently vague, which could by slight transpositions be made to do service in every case. I committed it to memory. It ran somewhat as follows. The play or novel entitled is generally conceded to be one of the most carefully constructed and artistically developed of all as here insert name of author many masterly productions. The genius of the author has enabled him skillfully to portray the atmosphere and characters of the period. The scene is laid in and the time roughly is that of the th century. The hero is the heroine, and after numerous obstacles and ingenious complications they eventually marry. The character of the old here insert father, mother, uncle or grandparent, gardener or family servant is delightfully whimsical and humorous, and full of subtle touches. The tragic element is furnished by the... The author touches with keen satire on the follies and vices of the time, while the interest in the principal love affair is sustained until the final denouement. Altogether, it would be difficult to imagine a more brilliant example of dramatic or literary art. I give this rather shocking example of sophomoric shiftlessness for the purpose of illustrating my attitude toward my educational opportunities and what was possible in the way of dexterously avoiding them. All I had to do was to learn the names of the chief characters in the various plays and novels prescribed. If I could acquire a brief scenario of each so much the better. Invariably they had heroes and heroines, good old servants or grandparents, and merry jesters. At the examination I successfully simulated familiarity with a book I had never read and received a commendatory mark. This happy-go-lucky frame of mind was by no means peculiar to myself. Indeed, I believe it to have been shared by the great majority of my classmates. The result was that we were sent forth into the world without having mastered any subject whatsoever, or even followed it for a sufficient length of time, to become sincerely interested in it. The only study I pursued more than one year was English composition, which came easily to me, and which in one form or another I followed throughout my course. Had I adopted the same tactics with any other of the various branches open to me, such as history, chemistry, or languages, I should not be what I am today, a hopelessly superficial man. Mind you, I do not mean to assert that I got nothing out of it at all. 
Undoubtedly, I absorbed a smattering of a variety of subjects that might on a pinch pass for education. I observed how men with greater social advantages than myself brushed their hair, wore their clothes, and took off their hats to their women friends. Frankly, that was about everything I took away with me. I was a victim of that liberality of opportunity, which may be a heavenly gift to a postgraduate in a university, but which is intellectual damnation to an undergraduate collegian. The chief fault that I have to find with my own education, however, is that at no time was I encouraged to think for myself. No older man ever invited me to his study, there quietly and frankly to discuss the problems of human existence. I was left entirely vague as to what it was all about, and the relative values of things were never indicated. The same emphasis was placed on everything, whether it happened to be the Darwinian theory, the fall of Jerusalem, or the character of Ophelia. I had no philosophy, no theory of morals, and no one ever even attempted to explain to me what religion or the religious instinct was supposed to be. I was like a child trying to build a house and gathering materials of any substance, shape, or color without regard to the character of the intended edifice. I was like a man trying to get somewhere and taking whatever paths suited his fancy first one and then another. Irrespective of where they led, the why and the wherefore were unknown questions to me, and I left the university without any idea as to how I came to be in the world or what my duties toward my fellow men might be. In a word, the two chief factors in education passed me by entirely, and my mind received no discipline. B. And the fundamental propositions of natural philosophy were neither brought to my attention nor explained to me. These deficiencies have never been made up. Indeed, as to the first, my mind, instead of being developed by my going to college, was seriously injured. My memory has never been good since, and my methods of reading and thinking are hurried and slipshod. This is a small thing compared with the lack of any philosophy of life. I acquired none as a youth, and I have never had any since. For fifty years I have existed without any guiding purpose except blindly to get ahead without any religion. Either natural or dogmatic. I am one of a type of pretty good, perfectly aimless man, without any principles at all. They tell me that things have changed at the universities since my day, and that the elective system is no longer in favor. Judging by my own case, the sooner it is abolished entirely, the better for the undergraduate. I should, however, suggest one important qualification, namely, that a boy be given the choice in his freshman year of three or four general subjects, such as philosophy, art, history, music, science, languages, or literature, and that he should be compelled to follow the subjects he elects throughout his course. In addition, I believe the relation of every study to the whole realm of knowledge should be carefully explained. Art cannot be taught apart from history. History cannot be grasped independently of literature. Religion, ethics, science, and philosophy are inextricably involved one with another. But mere learning or culture, a knowledge of facts or of arts is unimportant as compared with a realization of the significance of life. The one is superficial, the other is fundamental. The one is temporal, the other is spiritual. 
there is no more wretched human being than a highly trained but utterly purposeless man which, after all, is only saying that there is no use in having an education without a religion, that unless someone is going to live in the house, there is not much use in elaborately furnishing it. I am not attempting to write a treatise on pedagogy, but, when all is said, I am inclined to the belief that my unfortunate present condition, whatever my material success may have been, is due to lack of education in philosophy in its broadest sense. In mental discipline, and in actual acquirement, it is in this last field that my deficiencies and those of my class are superficially most apparent. A wide fund of information may be less important than a knowledge of general principles, but it is none the less valuable. And all of us ought to be equipped with the kind of education that will enable us to understand the world of men as well as the world of nature. It is, of course, essential for us to realize that the physical characteristics of a continent may have more influence on the history of nations than mere wars or battles. However far-reaching the foreign policies of their rulers, but, in addition to an appreciation of this and similar underlying propositions governing the development of civilization, the educated man who desires to study the problems of his own time and country, to follow the progress of science and philosophy, and to enjoy music, literature and art, must have a certain elementary equipment of mere facts. The oriental attitude of mind that enabled the Shah of Persia calmly to decline the invitation of the Prince of Wales to attend the Derby on the ground that he knew one horse could run faster than another, is foreign to that of Western civilization. The Battle of Waterloo is a flyspeck in importance contrasted with the problem of future existence. But the man who never heard of Napoleon would make a dull companion in this world or the next. We live in direct proportion to the keenness of our interest in life, and the wider and broader this interest is. The richer and happier we are. A man is as big as his sympathies, as small as his selfishness. The yokel thinks only of his dinner and his snooze under the hedge, but the man of education rejoices in every new production of the human brain. Advantageous intercourse between civilized human beings requires a working knowledge of the elementary facts of history, of the achievements in art, music, and letters, as well as of the principles of science and philosophy. When people go to quarreling over the importance of a particular phase of knowledge or education, they are apt to forget that, after all, it is a purely relative matter, and that no one can reasonably belittle the value of any sort of information. But furious arguments arise over the question as to how history should be taught, and whether a boy's head should be crammed full of dates. Nobody in his senses would want a boy's head crammed full of dates any more than he would wish his stomach stuffed with bananas. But both the head and the stomach need some nourishment better dates than nothing. If a knowledge of a certain historical event is of any value whatsoever, the greater and more detailed our knowledge the better including, perhaps, but not necessarily its date. The question is not essentially whether the dates are of value but how much emphasis should be placed on them to the exclusion of other facts of history. There is no use trying to remember dates is a familiar cry. There is about as much sense in such a statement as the announcement, 
There is no use trying to remember who wrote Henry Esmond. Composed the Fifth Symphony or painted The Last Supper. There is a lot of use in trying to remember anything. The people who argue to the contrary are too lazy to try. I suppose it may be conceded, for the sake of argument, that every American, educated or not, should know the date of the Declaration of Independence and have some sort of acquaintance with the character and deeds of Washington. If we add to this the date of the discovery of America and the first English settlement, the inauguration of the first president, the Louisiana Purchase, the naval war with England, the war with Mexico, the Missouri Compromise, and the firing on Fort Sumter, we cannot be accused of pedantry. It certainly could not do any one of us harm to know these dates or a little about the events themselves. This is equally true, only in a lesser degree, in regard to the history of foreign nations. Any accurate knowledge is worthwhile. It is harder, in the long run, to remember a date slightly wrong than with accuracy. The dateless man, who is as vague as I am about the League of Cambrai or Philip Roman II, will loudly assert that the trouble incident to remembering a date in history is a pure waste of time. He will allege that a general idea, a very favorite phrase, is all that is necessary. In the case of such a person, you can safely gamble that his so-called general idea is no idea at all. Pin him down, and he will not be able to tell you within five hundred years the dates of some of the cardinal events of European history, the invasion of Europe by the Huns. For instance, was it before or after Christ? He might just as well try to tell you that it was quite enough to know that our civil war occurred somewhere in the 19th century. I have personally no hesitation in advancing the claim that there are a few elementary principles and fundamental facts in all departments of human knowledge which every person who expects to derive any advantage from intelligent society should not only once learn, but should forever remember. Not to know them is practically the same thing as being without ordinary means of communication. One may not find it necessary to remember the binomial theorem or the algebraic formula for the contents of a circle. But he should at least have a formal acquaintance with Julius Caesar, Hannibal, Charlemagne, Martin Luther, Francis I, Queen Elizabeth, Louis Roman XIV, Napoleon I, and a dozen or so others. An educated man must speak the language of educated men. I do not think it too much to demand that in history he should have in mind, at least approximately, one important date in each century in the Chronicles of France, England, Italy, and Germany. That is not much, but it is a good start. And shall we say ten dates in American history? He should, in addition, have a rough working knowledge of the chief personages who lived in these centuries and were famous in war. Diplomacy, art, religion, and literature. His one little date will at least give him some notion of the relation the events in one country bore to those in another. I boldly assert that in a half hour you can learn by heart all the essential dates in American history. I assume that you once knew, and perhaps still know, something about the events themselves with which they are connected. Ten minutes a day for the rest of the week, and you will have them at your fingers' ends. It is no trick at all. 
It is as easy as learning the names of the more important parts of the mechanism of your motor. There is nothing impossible or difficult, or even tedious, about it. But it seems Herculean because you have never taken the trouble to try to remember anything. It is the same attitude that renders it almost physically painful for one of us to read over the scenario of an opera or a column biography of its composer before hearing a performance at the Metropolitan. Yet fifteen minutes or half an hour invested in this way pays about five hundred percent. And the main thing, after you have learned anything, is not to forget it. Knowledge forgotten is no knowledge at all. That is the trouble with the elective system as usually administered in our universities. At the end of the college year, the student tosses aside his elements of geology and forgets everything between its covers. What he has learned should be made the basis for other and more detailed knowledge. The instructor should go on building a superstructure on the foundation he has laid and at the end of his course the aspirant for a diploma should be required to pass an examination on his entire college work. Had I been compelled to do that, I should probably be able to tell now what I do not know whether Melanchthon was a painter, a warrior, a diplomat, a theologian, or a dramatic poet. I have instanced the study of dates, because they are apt to be the storm center of discussions concerning education. It is fashionable to scoff at them in a superior manner. We all of us loathe them, yet they are as indispensable a certain number of them as the bones of a body. They make up the skeleton of history. They are the orderly pegs on which we can hang later acquired information. If the pegs are not there, the information will fall to the ground. For example, our entire conception of the Reformation, or of any intellectual or religious movement, might easily turn on whether it preceded or followed the discovery of printing. And our mental picture of any great battle, as well as our opinion of the strategy of the opposing armies, would depend on whether or not gunpowder had been invented at the time. Hence the importance of a knowledge of the dates of the invention of printing and of gunpowder in Europe. It is ridiculous to allege that there is no minimum of education, to say nothing of culture, which should be required of every intelligent human being if he is to be but a journeyman in society, in an unconvincing defense of our own ignorance, we loudly insist that detailed knowledge of any subject is mere pedagogy. A hindrance to clear thinking, a superfluity. We do not say so, to be sure, with respect to knowledge in general. But that is our attitude in regard to any particular subject that may be brought up. Yet to deny the value of special information is tantamount to an assertion of the desirability of general ignorance. It is only the politician who can afford to say, wide knowledge is a fatal handicap to forcible expression. This is not true of the older countries. In Germany, for instance, a knowledge of natural philosophy languages and history, is insisted on. To the German schoolboy, George Washington is almost as familiar a character as Columbus. But how many American children know anything of Bismarck? The ordinary educated foreigner speaks at least two languages and usually three. Is fairly well grounded in science and is perfectly familiar with ancient and modern history. 
The American college graduate seems like a child beside him so far as these things are concerned. We are content to live a hand-to-mouth mental existence on a haphazard diet of newspapers and the lightest novels. We are too lazy to take the trouble either to discipline our minds or to acquire, as adults, the elementary knowledge necessary to enable us to read intelligently even rather superficial books on important questions vitally affecting our own social physical, intellectual, or moral existences. If somebody refers to Huss or Wycliffe ten to one we do not know of whom he is talking. The same thing is apt to be true about the draft of the hot water furnace or the ball and cock of the tank in the bathroom. Inertia and ignorance are the handmaidens of futility. Heaven forbid that we should let anybody discover this aridity of our minds. My wife admits privately that she has forgotten all the French she ever knew could not even order a meal from a carte du jour. Yet, she is a never-failing source of revenue to the counts and marquises, who yearly rush over to New York to replenish their bank accounts by giving parlor lectures in their native tongue on Le Xiaimes Siecle or Madame Lebrun. No one would ever guess that she understands no more than one word out of twenty, and that she has no idea whether Talleyrand lived in the fifteenth or the eighteenth century, or whether Calvin was a Frenchman or a Scotchman. Our clever people are content merely with being clever. They will talk Tolstoy or Turgenev with you, but they are quite vague about Catherine Roman II or Peter the Great. They are up on D'Annunzio, but not on Garibaldi or Cavour. Our ladies wear a false front of culture, but they are quite bald underneath. Being educated, however, does not consist, by any means, in knowing who fought and won certain battles, or who wrote the Novum Organum. It lies rather in a knowledge of life based on the experience of mankind. Hence our study of history. But a study of history in the abstract is valueless. It must be concrete, real, and living to have any significance for us. The schoolboy who learns by rote imagines the Greeks as outlined figures of one dimension, clad in helmets and tunics, and brandishing little swords. That is like thinking of Jean d'Arc as a suit of armor or of Theodore Roosevelt as a pair of spectacles. If the boy is to gain anything by his acquaintance with the Greeks, he must know what they ate and drank, how they amused themselves, what they talked about, and what they believed as to the nature and origin of the universe and the probability of a future life. I hold that it is as important to know how the Romans told time as that Nero fiddled while his capital was burning. William the Silent was once just as much alive as P. T. Barnum, and a great deal more worthwhile. It is fatal to regard historical personages as lay figures and not as human beings. We are equally vague with respect to the ordinary processes of our daily lives. I have not the remotest idea of how to make a cup of coffee or disconnect the gas or water mains in my own house. If my sliding door sticks I send for the carpenter, and if water trickles in the tank I telephone for the plumber. I am a helpless infant in the stable and my motor is the creation of a Frankenstein that has me at its mercy. My wife may recall something of cookery, which she would not admit, of course, before the butler, but my daughters have never been inside a kitchen. 
None of my family knows anything about housekeeping or the prices of foodstuffs or house furnishings. My coal and wood are delivered and paid for without my inquiring as to the correctness of the bills, and I offer the same temptations to dishonest tradesmen that a drunken man does to pickpockets. Yet, I complain of the high cost of living. My family has never had the slightest training in practical affairs. If we were cast away on a fertile tropical island, we should be forced to subsist on bananas and clams and clothe ourselves with leaves, provided the foliage was ready-made and came in regulation sizes. These things are vastly more important from an educational point of view than a knowledge of the relationship of Mary Stuart to the Duke of Guise. However interesting that may be to a reader of French history of the 16th century, a knowledge of the composition of gunpowder is more valuable than of Guy Fawkes' gunpowder plot. If we know nothing about household economies, we can hardly be expected to take an interest in the problems of the proletariat. If we are ignorant of the fundamental data of sociology and politics, we can have no real opinions on questions affecting the welfare of the people. The classic phrase, the public be damned, expresses our true feeling about the matter. We cannot become excited about the wrongs and hardships of the working class when we do not know and do not care how they live. One of my daughters, aged seven, once essayed a short story, of which the heroine was an orphan child in direst want. It began, Corinne was starving. Alas, what shall we do for food? She asked her French nurse, as they entered the carriage for their afternoon drive in the park. I have no doubt that even today this same young lady supposes that there are porcelain baths in every tenement house. I myself have no explanation as to why I pay eighty dollars for a business suit any of my bookkeepers seems to be equally well turned out for eighteen dollars and fifty cents. That is essentially why the people have an honest and well-founded distrust of those enthusiastic society ladies who rush into charity and frantically engage in the elevation of the masses. The poor working girl is apt to know a good deal more about her own affairs than the Fifth Avenue matron with an annual income of $350,000. If I were doing it all over again, and how I wish I could, I should insist on my girls being taught not only music and languages, but cooking, sewing, household economy, and stenography. They should at least be able to clothe and feed themselves and their children if somebody supplied them with the materials, and to earn a living if the time came when they had to do it. They have now no conception of the relative values of even material things, what the things are made of, or how they are put together. For them, hats, shoes, French novels, and roast chicken can be picked off the trees. This utter ignorance of actual life not only keeps us at a distance from the people of our own time, but renders our ideas of history equally vague. Abstract and unprofitable. I believe it would be an excellent thing if, beginning with the age of about ten years, no child were allowed to eat anything until he was able to tell where it was produced, what it cost, and how it was prepared. If this were carried out in every department of the child's existence, he would have small need of the superficial education furnished by most of our institutions of learning. Our children are taught about the famines of history when they cannot recognize a blade of wheat or tell the price of a loaf of bread. 
or how it is made. I would begin the education of my boy him of the tango and balkline billiards with a study of himself in the broad use of the term, before I allowed him to study about other people or the history of nations. I would seat him in a chair by the fire and begin with his feet. I would inquire what he knew about his shoes, what they were made of, where the substance came from, the cost of its production, the duty on leather, the process of manufacture, the method of transportation of goods, freight rates, retailing, wages, repairs, how shoes were polished, this would begin, if desired, a new line of inquiry as to the composition of said polish, cost, and so on comparative durability of hand and machine work, introduction of machines into England and its effect on industrial conditions. I say I would do all this, but, of course, I could not. I would have to be an educated man in the first place. Why, beginning with that dusty little pair of shoes, my boy and I might soon be deep in interstate commerce, and the theory of Malthus on familiar terms with Thomas A. Edison and Henry George. And the next time my son read about a Tammany politician giving away a pair of shoes to each of his adherents, it would mean something to him as much as any other master stroke of diplomacy. I would instruct every boy in a practical knowledge of the house in which he lives, give him a familiarity with simple tools and a knowledge of how to make small repairs and to tinker with the water pipes. I would teach him all those things I now do not know myself where the homeless man can find a night's lodging. How to get a disorderly person arrested. Why bottled milk costs 15 cents a quart. How one gets his name on the ballot if he wants to run for alderman, where the health department is located. And how to get vaccinated for nothing. By the time we had finished, we would be in a position to understand the various editorials in the morning papers, which now we do not read. Far more than that, my son would be brought to a realization that everything in the world is full of interest for the man who has the knowledge to appreciate its significance. A primrose by a river's brim should be no more suggestive even to a late poet, than a Persian rug or a rubber shoe. Instead of the rug, he will have a vision of the patient Afghan in his mountain village working for years with unrequited industry. Instead of the shoe, he will see King Leopold and hear the lamentations of the Congo. My ignorance of everything beyond my own private bank account and stomach is due to the fact that I have selfishly and foolishly regarded these two departments as the most important features of my existence. I now find that my financial and gastronomical satisfaction has been purchased at the cost of an infinite delight in other things. I am mentally out of condition. Apart from this break on the wheel of my intelligence, however, I suffer an even greater impediment by reason of the fact that, never having acquired a thorough groundwork of elementary knowledge, I find I cannot read with either pleasure or profit. Most adult essays or histories presuppose some such foundation. Recently I have begun to buy primers such as are used in the elementary schools in order to acquire the information that should have been mine at twenty years of age. And I have resolved that in my daily reading of the newspapers I will endeavor to look up on the map and remember the various places concerning which I read any news item of importance. And to assimilate the facts themselves. It is my intention also to study, 
at least half an hour each day. Some simple treaties on science, politics, art, letters, or history. In this way, I hope to regain some of my interest in the activities of mankind. If I cannot do this, I realize now that it will go hard with me in the years that are drawing nigh. I shall, indeed, then lament that I have no pleasure in them. It is the common practice of businessmen to say that when they reach a certain age, they are going to quit work and enjoy themselves. How this enjoyment is proposed to be attained varies in the individual case. One man intends to travel or live abroad usually, he believes, in Paris. Another is going into ranching or farming. Still another expects to give himself up to art, music and books. We all have visions of the time when we shall no longer have to go downtown every day and can indulge in those pleasures that are now beyond our reach. Unfortunately, the experience of humanity demonstrates the inevitability of the law of nature which prescribes that after a certain age it is practically impossible to change our habits, either of work or of play, without physical and mental misery. Most of us take some form of exercise throughout our lives, riding, tennis, golf, or walking. This we can continue to enjoy in moderation after our more strenuous days are over. But the manufacturer, stockbroker, or lawyer who thinks that after his 60th birthday, he is going to be able to find permanent happiness on a farm, loafing round Paris or reading in his library will be sadly disappointed. His habit of work will drive him back, after a year or so of wretchedness, to the factory, the ticker, or the law office and his habit of play will send him as usual to the races, the club, or the variety show. One cannot acquire an interest by mere volition. It is a matter of training and of years. The pleasures of today will eventually prove to be the pleasures of our old age, provided they continue to be pleasures at all, which is more than doubtful. As we lose the capacity for hard work, we shall find that we need something to take its place, something more substantial and less unsatisfactory than sitting in the club window or taking in the Broadway shows. But, at least, the seeds of these interests must be sown now if we expect to gather a harvest this side of the grave. What is more natural? than to believe that in our declining years we shall avail ourselves of the world's choicest literature and pass at least a substantial portion of our days in the delightful companionship of the wisest and wittiest of mankind, that would seem to be one of the happiest uses to which good books could be put. But the hope is vain. The fellow who does not read at fifty will take no pleasure in books at seventy. My club is full of dozens of melancholy examples of men who have forgotten how to read. They have spent their entire lives perfecting the purely mechanical aspects of their existences. The mind has practically ceased to exist so far as they are concerned. They have built marvelous mansions where every comfort is instantly furnished by contrivances as complicated and accurate as the machinery of a modern warship. The doors and windows open and close, the lights are turned on and off, and the elevator stops all automatically. If the temperature of a room rises above a certain degree, the heating apparatus shuts itself off. If it drops too low, something else happens to put it right again. 
The servants are swift, silent, and decorous. The food is perfection. Their motors glide noiselessly to and fro. Their establishments run like fine watches. They have had to make money to achieve this mechanical perfection. They have had no time for anything else during their active years. And now that those years are over, they have nothing to do. Their minds are almost as undeveloped as those of professional pugilists. Dinners and drinks, backgammon and billiards, the lightest opera, the trashiest novels, the most sensational melodrama, are the most elevating of their leisure's activities. Read. Hunt. Farm. Not much. They sit behind the plate glass windows and bet on whether more limousines will go north than south in the next ten minutes. If you should ask one of them whether he had read some book that was exciting discussion among educated people at the moment, he would probably look at you blankly and, after remarking that he had never cared for economics or history, as the case might be, inquire whether you preferred a blossom or a tornado. Poor vacuous old cocks, they might be having a green and hearty old age, surrounded by a group of the choicest spirits of all time. Upstairs in the library, there are easy chairs within arm's reach of the best fellows who ever lived adventurers. Storytellers, novelists, explorers, historians, rhymers, fighters, essayists, vagabonds, and general liars, immortals. All of them, you can take your pick, and if he bores you, send him packing without a word of apology. They are good friends to grow old with friends who, in hours of weariness, of depression, or of gladness, may be summoned at will by those of us who belong to the brotherhood of educated men of which, alas, I and my associates are no longer members. Chapter V. My Morals. The concrete evidence of my success as represented by my accumulated capital outside of my uptown dwelling house amounts. As I have previously said, to about $750,000. This is invested principally in railroad and mining stocks, both of which are subject to considerable fluctuation. And I have also substantial holdings in industrial corporations. Some of these companies I represent professionally. As a whole, however, my investments may be regarded as fairly conservative. At any rate, they cause me little uneasiness. My professional income is regular and comes with surprisingly little effort. I have as clients six manufacturing corporations that pay me retainers of $2,500 each. Besides my regular fees for services rendered, I also represent two banks and a trust company. All this is fixed business and most of it is attended to by younger men whom I employ at moderate salaries. I do almost no detail work myself, and my junior partners relieve me of the drawing of even important papers. So that, though I am constantly at my office, my time is spent in advising and consulting. I dictate all my letters and rarely take a pen in my hand. Writing has become laborious and irksome. I even sign my correspondence with an ingenious rubber stamp that imitates my scrawling signature beyond discovery. If I wish to know the law on some given point, I press a button and tell my managing clerk what I want. In an hour or two, he thanks for watching this video book is provided by Stream Books.